Okay guys, we're back. Computer and um, everything just kind of stopped, but we're gonna just do it as a part two. We're not gonna start over, of course we're not. We're gonna do it as a part two. Ready? Ready, set, go. So, we were talking about um, timeout for the toddlers, right? So we were saying, you know, that they should only be in timeout for a very small amount of time because maybe they can't concentrate. They don't know why they're still in timeout for that long amount of time. So people have to be very, very mindful of that. Now let's go ahead and talk about child seeking approval. Now, uh, we want to use a positive approach when possible because the children really, 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 these toddlers, they want to, you to approve what they're doing. They want to Feel like they're doing something good that's why they're such great little helpers um, their approval from you increase their self-confidence that's why we allow them to do some things and they may not do such a great job but we're just like oh my gosh we're just we're just so elated by how well they did you know such a good job you know Timmy fabulous do do, do. let's move on that helps them grow positive self-confidence. Now, the use of fear or physical aggression with a toddler does not foster self-control because then they will emulate that. Um, and some of them don't um, gather it as how the parent is wanting them to, okay? And this can lead to physical and emotional abuse. Um, they will just emulate and hit, you know, as well. Now, let's give you some examples of positive reactions to toddler's behaviors by the parent. A positive reaction is, oh my God, Timmy, I love this picture that you made. It's so good. It's literally a stick man, but he's going to keep doing it, which means what? He's going to keep getting better, okay? Uh, little Timmy wants to help you garden. You're doing such a good job, you know. Put the seed in the holes. The old, pack it down. That is so great. You're such a good helper. They're going to feel like they're really doing something, and then they're going to want to continue to be helpful. That's good positive reinforcement, okay? Now, parents' reaction to toddler's behavior affect the toddler's self-confidence. So if you are being poo poop on something that they've done or you're telling them that they could have done it better, then their self-confidence will dwindle, all right? Uh, physical aggression and fear tactics can affect toddlers very negatively because they take everything so figuratively. So they're going to become fearful of somebody who, let's just say, spanks them often. You know, they'll get more fear in them um, than understanding what's really going on. Or if you do fear tactics, like, you know, the boogeyman is going to get you if you don't stay in the bed tonight, little Jimmy Chow. Now he's scared of some figment of his imagination. At 13 years old, he's still looking under his bed, Chow. That, you know, that fear tactic makes their confidence and makes them have physical aggression, okay? Now, fear-provoking events affect um, the extent of the toddler's reaction. If, they al if they're alone, they're going to have greater fear by something that you might have said or tried to, you know, scare them with. And when fear has been um, learned, it is more difficult to eliminate it because it was something that was, you know, unfortunately taught to them. Um, stress increases fear of separation. Um, and self-consoling behaviors include favorite possessions or repetitious rituals. So like their favorite uh, bink, their favorite blanket, their favorite bunny, all right? Um, please make sure that you check your book for things that might be fear-evoking events. You know, like I said about the whole thing, trying to scare them into doing something or making them afraid of the dark or not um, expressing to them what's, you know, what the dark is and why they shouldn't be afraid or giving them a coping mechanism like a, like a night light. Um, and self-consoling behaviors, um, a toddler might implement when dealing with fear and separation is clutching to like their bunny or their blanket, you know, things like that. Now, let's talk about daily care when it comes to these toddlers. Now, adults should be at eye level when they're talking to the toddler because it seems less overwhelming and they can pay attention better. Um, flexibility schedules organized around the needs of the entire household is best for them. Clothing should be 
easy to put on and easy to take off because these little people want some autonomy and they want to be able to do it on their own. Um, and we always want to make sure that we are going to protect them from sunburn anytime they go out. Um, so here are some examples of household items that need to be adjusted to meet the needs of the entire household. So for instance, um, some of the household items are um, things that we would do, like we would make sure that we put up things that could harm the um, toddler. We're going to put it up for everybody, right? We're not going to just leave it out. Let's talk about scheduling. We're going to make sure that the schedule that we can put the, the toddler on fits well into everyone else's schedule, okay? Um, with the clothing thing, we want to make sure they're easy to put on and take off because this is a time period where we're potty training as well. And we want them to be able to pull them down on their own and pull them up on their own. Now, let's go on and talk about other daily care things like how their shoes should fit. They do need to wear shoes, okay? And the shoes should fit the shape of the foot and be about a half inch longer and a half inch wider than their foot size because we don't want to squeeze their foot or hurt their foot as they are trying to walk about. It is important for toddlers to wear their regular shoes to the doctor's appointments as it shows a healthcare provider how their body is being used and how their gait is when they're walking in their shoes, how their posture and their posture is greatly influenced by that of other family members, i.e. if everybody else is slouching, the child automatically believes that that is how they sit as well. Please make sure that you're looking in your book so that you can see the different shoe wear so that you can be comfortable and understand how they are to properly wear their shoes, when they should wear their shoes, and what is uh, proper shoes for a toddler. Now let's move on to uh, toilet independence. So much depends on the temperament of the toddler and the person guiding the toilet training. Now, voluntary control of anal and urethral sphincters begin around 18 to 24 months of age. So for a lot of children who were trying to potty train them much younger than that, and because we might think they, they want to be potty trained because you know, people tend to believe when they start taking off their diapers and things like that, they want to be potty trained. When mm, for the most part, that means that they recognize that they're wet and they don't want wet on them. That's it, that's all, okay? Now, there's methods to assist the toddler in potty training, routine pottying, um, situational pottying, where you make sure that they first get up and they potty. You put them on the potty, put them on the potty before they go to bed. You might want to do some routine pottying, that kind of things. Um, there's different ways that people like to decide to potty train their child, but we want to put as less stress on the child as possible. Um, now, the use of the potty chair, or we place the child on the toilet facing the tank, that tends to help them. Bow training is usually attempted first, okay, because that urine training, it's so frequent, all right? Now, you should never, ever, ever leave the child on the toilet for more than a few minutes at a time. Bladder training can begin when the toddler stays dry for about two hours or greater. That's when we know that we can start doing some bladder training for them. Please make sure that you write that down. If the toddler has special words for uh, bowel movements or urination, please sh uh, be sure to tell the health care providers or anybody taking care of the child um, and document it in their care plan for a toddler so that everybody is using the same word usage. Now let's talk about why it is necessary to place the toddler on the toilet for just a few minutes. Number one, they're not going to do anything if they're just sitting there, sitting there forever, and then they're going to forget why they're sitting there. What are we doing here? Okay, then they're going to do nothing but play. Now, what words, or they feel like it's a punishment. Okay, now what words might a toddler use um, to indicate that they have to urinate 
or they have to have a bowel movement. Some of you guys may have different lingo that you used uh, with your children. Um, so keep in mind that there's several, several different word usages um, that these children can use, okay? Now let's talk about nutrition with the toddler. The toddler, their caloric need declines to about 100 calories per kilogram per day. We want to limit the milk intake to no more than 24 ounces per day at that time. And the serving size is about one tablespoon of solid food per year of age. We are doing such a horrible, horrible job uh, with overfeeding these children and then wonder why they're obese or then we wonder why they have chronic illnesses like our grandparents had when they were older and as they're young. Um, food should be chopped into very fine pieces. Um, nothing that can get lodged um, like uh, something that is perfectly circular that is larger than than like a, 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 a um, nickel. Um, various foods should be offered so that we can see things that they like or their palate can try different things. And a two-year-old likes to have finger food, so they like things that they can pick up and eat. So, some examples of finger foods are, you know, things that we can chop up that they could just pick up. So you can almost make anything, you know, a finger food. And if they're well nourished, the toddler will show steady and proportional gain in height and weight. Okay. Um, some examples of various foods to offer during mealtime uh, are different vegetables, different fruit. Um, you might want to offer them different types of, you know, meats. That would be very helpful for them. Now let's talk about these little picky eaters. I had one of them, and she still kind of is, and she is 23 years old, child. So the picky eater, they're very selective about their food color, taste, texture, or smell, but will eat to maintain growth and development. So, uh, for example, my older, I'm sorry, my younger daughter, she does not eat anything red. <laughs> she won't do it. She won't drink anything red. She won't eat anything red. And it literally started um, as a toddler and her doctor told me that she was fine to leave it alone. Don't force her. And now we're 23 and we don't eat strawberries and um, we don't drink anything that's red. Okay, like it's not going to hurt her. Um the feeding disorder, this is when um, there's a refusing to eat to maintain growth and development leads to weight loss and development delays. That is feeding disorders, okay? So here we're talking about picky eaters and feeding disorders, which are two different things. Because if they're a picky eater, they still will eat to maintain growth and development, okay? But if they have a feeding disorder, they will not, and they will lose weight, and they will have some developmental delays. Now, according to the DSM, a feeding disorder is relabeled to be an avoidance or resistance to food intake that occurs before the age of six years old. Okay, before six years old. Now, let's talk about the dreaded daycare. Now, um, the daycare must meet the family's personal preferences, cultural uh, perspectives, financial and special needs, or that is not the daycare for your child, okay? Now, all daycares that you're deciding to put your child in should have a state approval. I know that is very different when we're dealing with child care that is a, uh, you know, the family member, you know, then that's kind of not a daycare. That's just, you know, the family watching the baby or babysitting the baby. So two different things. So I want to give an example of personal preferences a family might have and how it um, affects the choice of the daycare. So a personal preference may be you may not want your toddler to be in the, in the same room or go out to the playground with older children, okay? But this particular, you know, ABC daycare, they send all the kids out together. 
okay? Your personal preference is for that to not happen, all right? So then that is not the daycare for you, all right? Which, um, uh, that is people's prerogatives. That's why they need to learn what the daycares are doing prior to signing on the dotted line and giving these people your money and then being aggravated that they're not doing what you want. Now, let's talk about cultural issues that could affect the toddler in the daycare setting. So, let's just say that um, there is a uh, culture of... Um, any culture that you can think about. Um, and everything that they're doing in the daycare deals with that particular culture, okay? But your child is of another culture and you don't want them to be acclimated to your to the culture of that daycare all the time because that's not what you practice at home, then you understand that that is not the daycare center for you or for your family, okay? Um, uh, some special needs a toddler might have and how it could affect um, the care provided in the daycare setting. If your child does have special needs, but they can't meet the special needs, then that is not the daycare for your particular child. Now, there are some differs for toddlers during daycare because they have shorter attention spans, the tendency to engage in parallel play rather than group play that tend to do that. They need closer supervision to make sure that we're maintaining safety in the toddler rooms. Um, so let me give you an example of a toddler's attention span. I say that their attention span normally runs about every minute for their age. Okay, and then they're ready to move on to something else. Parallel play basically is when they are playing, you know, in close proximities, okay, but doing their own thing. Now, let's go ahead and move on and talk about injury prevention. Okay, now. The best prevention is knowledge for the age-appropriate risk and anticipation guidelines for the child that you are taking care of. Parents need to understand that their child activities at certain ages in order to prevent injuries by taking appropriate precautions for their particular child. Toddlers are very curious and they're very mobile, which is why things can sometimes accidentally happen. All right, now here are some examples of age appropriate risk for toddlers. I may let my toddler go to the playground and run around on some of the baby slides or the baby swings that you have to put your child in and manage to push yourself. I would not let my toddler run around a place that does not have any borders and where there are bigger playground equipment because they may then try to get on it and have some unsafe practices and hurt themselves. Now, let's talk about what are some of the dangers or what are some of the curious toddler behaviors that they may engage in when they're at home. Um, things like uh, water play. Now, water play can be very dangerous when they accidentally get near a pool, but then we gotta think about things that they could do inside your house, like play in the toilet, okay? Very unsafe, very unsanitary, um, and they could harm themselves with something like that, and they're just, you know, curious, and they're just engaging in, you know, norm what, what is normal for them, because it's just water to them. Now let's move on to consumer education. Now the federal government and private organizations regulate uh, variables to prevent injury when it comes to certain things like non-flammable sleepwear, child-proof things like child-proof caps, child-proof um, bottle tops, um, maximum temperatures for water heaters, uh, smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. We say that everyone should have one in their home. We start talking about this once a person is pregnant, you know. Um, slat spaces in a infant crib. So we like to educate our moms if they're getting old furniture or, okay, let's not say old, vintage 
furniture, um, hey, some of that stuff is outdated because now there's measurements on how far apart the slats can be so that the toddler doesn't accidentally get their heads stuck in the slats or wedge themselves in the slats, okay? And another thing that the federal government um, tries to enforce to prevent injury are car seats. Now, 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 I understand. Now, we've all seen it. Where, you know, um, Sally over here has her baby standing up in the car while, at the steering wheel while she's driving down I-25. Okay, N that's not okay. They have to be in a car restraint that is by their height and their weight. And it is turned in the manner of that the, um, the manufacturer says it needs to be for their age for safety. I don't care if you like it. I don't care if, if little Timmy like it. It's just what's best for everybody. Now we're going to move on to some different things about like toys um, and play. Now, parents must be taught to inspect toys. We don't really want toddlers to use toys that have little pieces that come apart or that come out, okay? Um, we must advise them to only buy toys that are suitable for the age skill and the ability of the child play is like work for toddlers like they need it they're gonna go there they're, that is their workstation they're gonna do it now through play they learn how to socialize they learn how to explore the world they learn how to manipulate and understand their own environment all right now how is play toddlers work because they do stuff like play kitchen play work on daddy's truck play, go to work. You know, they do things like that. They have uh, egocentric thinking. So, you know, it's all about them, child. Um, parallel play gradually leads to cooperative play, but not, not at the beginning, child, because it's a lot of mine, mine, mine. All right. Um, we like to protect the child from sunburn, mosquito bites, and other vectors. Um, and we want to always make sure that we are child-proofing these homes. This is very, very important. Now, um, let's talk about methods that should be used to child-proof the home. Like, sometimes there's older children in the home, so they're going to have toys that are meant for their age bracket that may have moving parts or parts that come apart. The parent just has a bigger job when that happens. You can't say, oh, well, that's, you know, uh, 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 Tyrone's stuff, and little Timmy just got into it. No, no, no. You are the parent. We teach the clients. You are the parent. You have to make sure that you're making sure the toddler is safe and that the toddler does not get a hold to Tyrone's things, okay, that are for older children. And we want to teach everybody who's going to be around our child about child-proofing their home. We want the babysitter, if they're going to the babysitter, to child-proof their home. If they're going to the grandparents to child-proof their home. Anybody who the child is going to be spending significant time with alone need to child-proof their home. All right. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. So pull out your pen and let's go. So let's say that you are the nurse, okay? And you are observing three toddlers and they're playing side by side with their dolls, okay? And when you look at them closer, uh, you note that the children are not really interacting with each other, but they're playing right next to each other. What type of play do you think this is? I wish I had a little thing that goes do 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 okay time is up do you consider that parallel play or do you consider that cooperative play very good young lady in the back it is parallel play okay now here's another one if you see a behavior okay of this child and this child is about 18 months old or so. And the toddler is um, told, I mean, the parent is told, is telling the clinician that the toddler is um, doing some things that's making them a little concerned, having some behaviors when, you know, that's making them concerned. 
Um, and let's see what could be concerning. Now, would you ever be concerned that the child may be pulling up uh, on furniture, pulling up on appliances? Well, yes, because why? Some of these things that may tilt over might harm the toddler. So we really, really want to make sure that we're paying attention to that. Here's another one that you guys might want to write down. Now, you are the nurse, okay? And you are discussing toilet training to the parents of your little bitty patient. And you would say, here are some behaviors by the child that would identify toilet training readiness, okay? Now, out of these that I state, which one of these do you suggest would be a sign that this child is ready for some toilet training? Would it be that the child is willing to sit on the potty for about 15 to 30 minutes? Does that make the child ready for toileting training? Or the fact that the child is able to communicate with you that they're wet, does that make you note that they may be ready for toilet training? Ding, ding, ding. The answer is B. The child who is learning to communicate with you that they are wet. They may be ready for toilet training. All right? Let's do a couple of more, shall we? Yes, Miss William, let's. Okay. Now, you are the nurse. All of my questions might start with you are the nurse. Okay. And you're doing a home visit. And you note that the parents require teaching interventions, okay, to protect their toddler who lives there, which one of these observations would lead the nurse to the conclusion that these parents may need some teaching intervention? Would it be that the fireplace has a screen on it? Would it be that there are paintings on the wall? Or would it be that the dining table may have a tablecloth on it? Let's think. Paintings on the wall. Well, that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. It's okay. As long as they're not so low where the child can take the, the frame off and beat themselves or do something. What about the, the fireplace has a screen on it? Well, no, because that's a protective mechanism. We love that. But the, this table with this tablecloth on here. You need teaching, baby girl and, and, and little son, because that child is grabbing onto things, pulling up. And what could they do with that tablecloth? Pull that tablecloth down and everything that's on top of it is going to do what? Come down on little Timmy. Okay? Last one, and I'm going to let you go. What do you, the nurse, consider? as an appropriate finger food snack for little Jimmy. He's two years old. Do you think little Jimmy should have grapes? Well, they are fruit. Do you think that little Jimmy should have hot dogs? Personally, I don't think anybody should, but that's my personal opinion. <laughs> or do you think that little Jimmy could have applesauce? Out of those three things, what do you think is safest for little Jimmy to have? Ding, 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 ding. Applesauce is the correct answer. Okay? Applesauce is the correct answer. That is it. That is all. Have a good night. Listen to me again later. Bye.